I'm Dr. Shirley Mirpad and I'm the director of the UWC Library. So I'm extremely honored to have this um, annual event. It's extremely honored to meet all of you and I really invite you to be part of the UWC Library uh, community. Thank you. So now can I, I hand over to Dr. Uh, Professor Palo. Good morning, everybody. I won't say uh, too much because we have a lot on our plate. Um, just maybe a few words on how this so on how this idea of a panel on Samura Michel came about. Um, as Alison has mentioned, we have an annual lecture, and last year, for various reasons, we, we couldn't have it. And then this year, talking to Alan, and as he was saying that he's writing a biography of some some more of Michelle, with I just I just with Barbara. Um, I just thought that there are so many people around us that are actually that have worked, are working, have ongo ongoing engagement with uh, more of Michelle. And so I thought it would be interesting to have a kind of polyphonic uh, dress this year, also to make up for the fact that last year we didn't have, we didn't have a lecture, now we're gonna have a, a, a double or a triple lecture um, uh, in, one, uh, in one slot. Uh, and two years ago, we had a lecture by Antonio Tomas on, uh, on uh, Milcar Cabral. So in some ways, we're also kind of reflecting on the legacies of Luzo from the liberation struggles. Um, and uh, as I'm sure it will appear in the pro pro proceedings, Samora Michel is a very um, contested figure in Mozambican history, a very important figure in the current conjuncture as well. Uh, a friend of mine once told me, if you, if you, if you want to ruin a dinner in Mozambique, you just have people talking about Samora because they will disagree fiercely and some will have horrible memories of somebody sent to re-education camps and some will have lovely memories of reciting poetry in the Tunduru Gardens and, and so on and so forth. So I think the, the multiplicity of voices is, um, I, I hope will also kind of render this the diversity of the figure of Samora Michel um, which has been at the center also of contemporary politics in Mozambique. Uh, so without further ado, I will introduce our guests one by one as they come. So first is Professor Alan Isaacman, Professor of History at the University of Minnesota. Um, um, since we got five uh, interventions back to back, which is gonna be a little bit hard on you, but I hope not, because they're gonna be very lively and entertaining. I've asked to the speakers that they speak for 15, 20 minutes, uh, so that we can then have lots of time for, uh, for uh, questions at the end. And we're going to listen to the five presentations and then we're going to invite you to take some, some snacks and to come back for the, uh, for the Q&A at the end. Alan. So Alan is going to speak about the challenges of writing a biography of Samora Michel. So this is a uh a book, a short book that's meant to, that we're writing, Bobby and I, that's meant to be used in classrooms uh, in Mozambique and in North America, the global north, and here as well. It will be published in South Africa uh, shortly. I want to thank the director. I want to thank Allison, and I want to particularly thank Sipiwe for all the wonderful work she's done uh, on, this, on this collection. Uh, there are I've learned a lot from our distinguished speakers, and I think you will. I also want to acknowledge the presence of Anne Pitchard. Anne, can you, who has written extensively on Mozambique and including a very important article on, uh, on the struggles over Samoa Michelle's memories, which I'll mention in passing, all the good ideas I got from her. Uh, the other thing I want to say is, even though I'm doing the speaking, uh, if you have questions, and we hope you'll have many, because this is still at a preliminary stage, our book, and we would like your harshest comments and criticisms, direct all the hard questions to Bobby, and I'll take, I'll take the easy ones. Okay, so let me, what I'd like to do is two things. Talk about the epistemological and methodological challenges of writing a, a biography of Samoa Michel, and then some of the conclusions. And obviously I can't do justice to this in 15 to 20 minutes, and I'm going to speak very quickly, so if, but if you don't understand something, please interrupt me right away, okay? So, so one of the first things that I want to say, one of the basic pre premises, is that all the 
documentation, all the data that we have, all knowledge itself is partial, fragmentary, and socially situated. The evidentiary base for Samoa, on Samoa is particularly uh, fragmentary. There are, unlike the writings, the youth, or writings about uh, Monzlan or Julius Nereri, there's very few personal letters, very little about Samoa, particularly in his youth, there's almost uh, nothing there. Uh, and added to the absence of his own writings is the fact that most of the most significant documents that Frelimo had and collected in Dar es Salaam, which was itself a collection that was disorganized, uh, were lost as they were shipped to, to Mozambique. They fell off the boat, literally. So we have enormous gaps. The Frelimo archives themselves are closed with some exceptions and terribly disorganized across the board. The other source that is rich are the secret police archives in Lisbon, but those reflect the race, class, and gender biases of the Portuguese secret police. So if you want to find out what a monster Samora was or uh, what a villain or what a dupe of the Soviets or the Chinese, it's all there in enormous, enormous detail. So on the one hand, the evidentiary base is very weak. There have been in the last couple of years about 20 memoirs written by people who uh, fought side by side with Samora, and they tend to both celebrate their own, the lives of the authors, and also uh, reveal both the admiration and fear that people had of Samora. There's also 15 or so uh, published intervie uh, interviews that were collected in the uh, beginning of the 20th century by Samora's the principal leaders of the revolution, uh, Chapandi, Pashinwap, etc., which are very interesting. I also have collected a whole bunch of interviews and had the first uh, interview that with Samora after independence. I and Ian Christie, there's a picture of us over there, a very prominent uh, Scottish journalist. So there, we have that in, that information, but nevertheless, it's very very fragmentary. And of course, with the oral data that I collected. Let me be very clear about it. Some of the material, some of the oral material, is limited because of memories lost, things going back to the 60s and 70s. Others is, is limited because of the uh, memories that are suppressed or forgotten. For instance, the killing of nationalists who were opposed to Frelimo, such as Uri Uriya Samango. And others is material that people know but won't discuss, like who was involved on the Mozambican side, if anyone, in the plane crash at Muzini. There's a lot of theories, there's a lot of rumors. People very close to Samoa uh, uh, just don't want to talk about it. So on the one hand, it's an evidentiary problem. The second issue is, uh, even though we're trying to do a biography, and there's a tendency in writing biographies, especially about males, that there's almost nothing about their personalized, the affective part. And that's also true here. We just don't have a lot of data about Samoa, the person, Samoa's family. Bobby and I are going to be interviewing the children and, and, and Grasa. There are a set of beautiful letters that Samoa wrote to Josina Michelle, his first wife, which are really fantastic. They're in the Samoa Michelle Documentation Center. So one problem is an evidentiary problem. The second problem is a problem about the person himself. And the third, which is very important, is our positionality. And I want to be very, very clear about that. Bobby and I are longtime Frelimo supporters. Frelimo, uh, we went to Mozambique in 1968. We saw the colonial oppression. We came back and started to work as a committee for a free Mozambique with Shah Fuqin Khan. Uh, when the first, my dissertation, the first book won a, a national, international award. We donated the money to, uh, to Frelimo after independence. Bobby was invited to teach in the law school and work with the Mozambican uh, women's movement. I was the first one to teach, person to teach uh, African, uh, Mozambican history. Uh, and many of my students have done just wonderful work. So, and also, so we, and then we live there with our children from 1978 to 1980 and we go there every year. I have to say also, even though we are a we, we fight a great deal about this, and Bobby tended to be much more skeptical than I. I was more of the 
partisan and romantic. So know about our politics because it, our own positionality is very important. And it's also particularly important when the relationship between a biographer and the biogra biographer's subject. So we come to this with a passionate commitment to uh, the liberation struggle of Mozambique and the anti-colonial struggle, but also with the understanding that we have to keep open analytical space for doubt and a willingness to criticize the men and women that we admired. As Edward Said said, never solidarity before criticism. And that's the sort of the perspective that we take. Uh, some may think that we're not critical enough. Others will think that we are too critical. Samora was very important. We knew him well. We admired him. Uh, so this is in part also personal, very personal. But let me just jump quickly uh, to point out several of the findings that we think are most significant and then invite you, invite your criticisms later on because there's much that we can't talk about. The first thing I want to say is Samora's political formation reflected his own lived experience. He lived colonialism and he confronted Portuguese colonialism in his daily life in every single way. So for instance, it took him nine years, eight years to get to the third grade and he graduated at the top of his class. It was characteristic that most Africans did not graduate uh, equivalent of third grade. Uh, he was an exception. Uh, so he experienced the oppression and he was considered a rebel in school. But it took him eight years to get three years, through three years of work. Then, he, because he dreamed about being a doctor, he went uh, on to try to go to for post third grade. And he was only way he was allowed to continue is by converting to Catholicism. Because in 1941, the Portuguese government essentially transferred the education of Africans to the Catholic Church. And even though he came from a military, a very deeply religious uh, Protestant family, and also a family that was very engaged in, anti, in nationalist and an early anti-colonial activity, and his grandfather was involved in the rebellion in 1898, the Magro Grani, uh, 1903, the Magro Grani Rebellion, uh, uh, he had to convert, and only then was he allowed to go on up to the equivalent of, fi of fifth grade. He also lived and experienced Portuguese colonialism. He saw all the peasants in his community forced to grow cotton uh, in Mozambique, and we read a book about it called Cotton is the Mother of Poverty. It just impoverished everyone. It was brutal and repressive. He saw the Portuguese settlers coming and appropriating all the lands in the rich Limpopo Valley. And his brother and uncles and many of his and family members, uh, uh, a number of them died or were dismembered working in the mines of South Africa. So he lived colonialism, colonialism very profoundly. And even though, given all that he experienced, he was more privileged than most because he came from a social category, a legal category known as assimilados, assimilated. So he was a little better off than most people. The other important thing is as he finished, after he finished his education, uh, he snuck off to uh, Lorenzo Marx, the capital, and worked as a nurse. Now working as a male nurse, he studied and worked as a male nurse, was the highest paying job an African male could uh, have. But he experienced the racism and colonial exploitation associated with the structuring of health and hospitals and how Africans in segregated wards didn't get any attention and African nurses earned a lot less than their European counterparts. But the other thing that's very important about uh, his exp early experience is that he had close contacts with a number of white Mozambicans. And actually, he escaped being arrested by the secret police because a white Portuguese drug salesman named João, João Ferreira informed him that the secret police were coming to arrest him. And when he fled to Dar es Salaam to work for Frelimo, he left his family in Lorenzo Marx 
in under the protection of a white doctor. So, and that's very, very important because one of Ma Samoa's most dominant features is his uh, commitment to non-racialism. So, the f first point is this biography, even though we don't know much, is very, very important. The second point is that he was a nationalist. Above all else, Samoa Michel was a nationalist, but he was a nationalist of a particular stripe. That is, for him, capturing the state and creating the net nation was necessary but not sufficient. In that regard, he was very different than most African nationalist leaders of the period because he saw uh, capturing the state and creating a nation as a jumping off point for a larger social revolution and a socialist revolution. And Samora Michel was a Marxist. Very, very clear about this. There's a lot of different theories about how he came to Marxism. Uh, some argue because he was a male nurse, he couldn't possibly un read and understand Marx. Others argued that he was, that there were a series of Mozambicans who studied in Europe, in France, who were associated with the Communist Party or the Portuguese part, Communist Party, or the French Communist Party, who influenced him or brainwashed him. None of this is accurate. His Marxism, as he and others uh, have indicated, people very close to him, his Marxism came from the gut. His Marxism came, as he told <laughs> Herb Shore in, in the 1970s, came from seeing his, his neighbors having to grow for, uh, cotton, seeing his neighbors losing their land, seeing his brother, his uncle, killed in the mines. But he, so he came from his lived experience. But he also, even though he only had a limited education, he was a very serious intellectual. And he read Fanon, who influenced him enormously. Fanon is as significant uh, as any of the Marxist thinkers, but he read also Mao and, and Marx. And in Nashingwea, he was very influenced by Chinese advisors there. But, so th they helped him theorize what he experienced. But the important thing is when he arrived in Nashingwea and colleagues gave him a copy of one of Marx's writings and he read it, a pamphlet, he read it and turned to a friend and said, I've read this once before, talking about his own life, that he essentially had experienced it. So his, his Marxism comes out of his, a deep personal experience and a commitment to social uh, justice. His Marxism is also infused, ironically, well, maybe not ironically, with a heavy Protestant morality. He studied, he came from a very religious family, and if you look in his writings and his speeches, and Cohen has talked about this, his lit, he talks a great deal about work, discipline. He got on this crazy thing about uh, uh, w w girl, uh, women wearing mini skirts and high heels, uh, men in bell-bottom pants, and he used to always criticize me because I had hair down to here. So he had this notion of, you know, you had to be disciplined in all respects, and that comes out of his missionary background. Uh, the other point, that other points, I'm going to make four more very quickly, is he had a profound belief in people's agency and the power of history. So his, um, his grandfather, his grandfather fought against the Portuguese, and he used to spend a great deal of time standing next to the sacred tree where many of the heroes from the Gaza area, uh, their ancestors, I believe, have been uh, buried. Uh, when he moved into areas, like in the far north, in the Yao area, the first thing he did was sort out a, the, the grandson of a chief named Mataka, who fought against the Portuguese in the end, beginning of the 20th century. When he got to the Zambezi Valley, he reached out to Macombi, who fought against the Portuguese. So he understood the power of history. He also understood the power of people's agency. And here's one way that he was, he was not at all dogmatic and was much more influenced by his own experience and also by the, the Chinese than, than, than Marxist theory, and that he believed in the historical agency and power of the peasantry. So the notion of peasants as a sack of potatoes, which Marx talks about, uh, he uh, dismissed. And he understood that peasants, he talks about in a long interview with us, he talked about peasant science well before academics talked about peasant science. And he talked about 
peasants' ability to theorize based on their own experience and to think abstractly. That had led him to claim in an in interview that we had that peasants would naturally gravitate to Marxism even though they didn't read Marx because it said they understood exploitation, they lived exploitation. And from there it was only a, a logical next step to becoming a Marxist. Well, that was a leap of faith which was clearly uh, incorrect. But he did have a great appreciation of peasant culture and peasant values at the same time, and he was really schizophrenic about this, at the same time, he was really, oppo he was really opposed to what he considered to be a pe obscurantism. Uh, you let me know when I'm, I'm just about there, okay? So uh, he was very opposed to traditional historic religion, to polygamy, to bride price, part of which was his commitment to the emancipation of women, but also he had a bigger project, and his bigger project um, I'm going to be fine. His bigger project was that he was deeply committed not only in the Marxism, but a type of socialist high modernism. Socialist high modernism. He believed he had these grandiose plans to transform society. And he believed by the power of his person, as well as the political mobilization of Fulimo, that they could jump over history and end the inequalities and social ills of colonialism. And he did part of this, and again, Colin has written about this, he was a great performer. He would sing at every public gathering. And they were all over the country, this public gathering. Fidel Castro said, Samor Michel is the only man who, uh, political leader, who can organize a revolution through song. Uh, and in the end, his, his, his agenda was very mixed. His grandiose play. He believed to use a word, a term I think Ann Pitcher talked about. He believed that he could drag Mozambicans into development and into a better world. And without going into all the details, there were some real successes in the social sectors, in education, emancipation of women, free health, housing. He also was committed to building a non racial society. And if you look at it, at the, whether it's the Council of Ministers or uh, made up of Asians and Mozambicans of Asian descent or uh, European descent. He said, famously, you can ha if you can have black Portuguese, referring to those Africans collaborating with the colonial government, then you can have white Mozambicans. And he was steadfastly committed to that. Where he was less successful and uh, was this notion of transforming the economy, and I'll be very happy to discuss that, and also to creating a new culture. He believed that somehow you could dissect culture, which you can, and keep some things from the historic past and say the other things are obscurantist and bring them together into a new socialist reality, which he called the new socialist man. It was very interesting. It was a new socialist man, not new socialist man and woman. So he, the economy was, uh, was really, he was very ineffective. Uh, a little bit more effective in the industrial sector than in the agricultural sector. And he underestimated the power of Renamo, dismissing them simply as bandits or as an arm of the South Africans, which they were, but didn't ever allow for the possibility that they could take on a new social reality and create a new social base, part of which come, comes because people became satisfied with many of S'mores politics, or uh, truly most politics. He was also underestimated the power of, of the apartheid regime. I remember him telling me, uh, we start the revolution against the Portuguese with a hundred young boys and girls with a handful of guns. We beat the Portuguese. We can take on the South Africans. And then in 1981, he said very famously in this brief, let bring them on. Well, when the South Africans came on, Mozambique was just unprepared. And so he overestimated the uh, uh, underestimated Renamo, the apartheid regime, and he overestimated the support he was going to get from the Soviet Union, who ultimately betrayed him in a variety, in a number of ways, which I'll be very happy to discuss. And then finally, the last point I want to mention, which speaks to some of the work that Anne has uh, and done after his death, uh, there was a moment of enormous grief throughout much of the country, not all the country clearly, but much of the country, and then. Uh, when the new government Shishano came to power, uh, as Anne has suggested, there was this 
a long history of forgetting from above, to use Anne's term, where essentially the whole socialist moment was obliterated. As Moses, as Frelimo became, uh, became part of the uh, global neoliberal economy, and you have structural adjustment, etc., and uh, some more is obliterated uh, from the public discourse, from the magazines, the press control, etc., and only reappears essentially in, 19, in 2005 when Gabuza replaces Chisano, and Gabuza needing su to have some popular, needing some popular support, essentially uh, re. Uh, Builds all these statues and reset celebrates more, but only the nationalist part of Samoa, not the socialist part of Samoa. So Samoa was out Samoaism, but at the same time, as my distinguished colleague here has talked about in terms of rap songs, there's a whole other. While the state was obliterating Samoa, Samoa's memory remains powerful and live, and is expressed in popular culture through rap songs. Paulo's collected a number of songs in the Far North in Mokonde, uh, and, and people remember some more, uh, not all, in all pla places. In fact, we're going to go to some Renamo areas to find out how they remember that, but some more remains very powerful. In fact, more his memory and, and the idealization of some more and the lionization of some more is more powerful now than any time since his death. So in the end, our assessment is, uh, is you know, it's, what's the right word? It's provisional. But what we can say, without some more, Mozambique would have never taken the shape that it did. And all the powerful and magnificent things that happened wouldn't have happened. And many of the terrible things which he bears responsibility for also uh, wouldn't happen. But on, on, on balance, we come away with a real appreciation for some more of the man and for his vision, which wasn't always achieved, and sometimes the, the strategies and methods that he and people under him support, supported him to achieve what they thought were revolutionary goals were actually anti-democratic and in opposition to the notion of people power and popular democracy. It's kind of a new space for me. I've been making films for, or involved in the filmmaking world for a long time, and now I'm kind of coming back into this to the academic world. But in a space like this, the, um, the trick up my sleeve is that I don't have to talk so much, I can just show you things. So it's good for you and good for me. Um, so I'm going to talk to you about uh, a film I've been involved with as an editor. The director, his name is Lawrence Hamburger, he lives in Joburg, couldn't be here unfortunately. He's been making this film with um, the, the son of uh, José Fougage, the architect from Mozambique, which, who's the main character in the film, and a piece that he made uh, um, in memorial of uh, the crash at Mbuzini is what the film is about. Um, so it's less so about, uh, about Samora, actually, and more about his ideals and the ideals that uh, Fougage kind of upheld in himself and in his work um, and in the piece itself. So the the film, so I came at a late stage, so Lawrence and Pipash uh, have been making this film or collecting uh, uh, footage over the past 20 years, maybe more, and last year we started editing and um, that it's not the film is not just about the crash and um, uh, the memorial that was erected, but it's about uh, a human ideal that died on, that day. Um, and the spirit of Samora and what he had he inculcated what he wanted to do was in a way channeled by uh, Fujaj into this spirit into this piece into the memorial. And that was hopefully the spirit that we went into in the construction of this um, of this film. Um, we may well have failed, but uh, I mean we can't really compare ourselves to those people. But at least we're we're trying to uh, uh, react to, to that spirit in a way. Um, it's a 30-minute film. It's not finished yet. We're still in the process of finishing it. But I I will show you some clips from it. Um, so. Uh, 
so we believe, or I believe, I didn't know anything about the memorial before uh, um, I worked on the film. I, I knew it existed. I'd never seen it. I'd never touched it. I'd never been there. Um, I knew there was something there, but I didn't know anything about it. And this is partly the reasoning behind Fujaj's construction of the monu monument, at the memorial, as opposed to a monument. Um, if you were given the chance to, uh, if a memorial didn't exist, right, to the, to the crash of Samora, and someone was allocated the task of doing it, generally, it would, what would it have been, right? In the idea of how monuments uh, uh, and memorials are constructed in African context, what would it be? It would have been a statue, possibly, more than likely, to one man, even though 35 people died that day, um, or it would have been some kind of, some other, almost, I guess, grotesque way of uh, viewing this space, which is what ultimately happened. And this is what we kind of look at in the film. Um, and I think that Zer wanted to, uh, wanted to inculcate an experience of the travesty and of the trauma that happened on that day. So the, the memorial is not designed to be beautiful. It's not designed to be, uh, to be loved and to, to be adorned. It's designed to make you feel, uh, in a way, feel the trauma of the, what happened um, to these 35 people and not just this one person, which is also quite poignant that we're having this symposium about the one man but the, the memorial and how, how Zeh saw it was not about him. It was not about Samora. It was about the ideas and the ideals that also went down that day. So let me show you, and I'll, I'll split it into three. I'm going to show you three sections. Uh, firstly, to do with um, trauma, right? The trauma of the crash itself. The trauma that it had on Mozambique, on the people of Mozambique, on his friends and his family. Um, and uh, then we're going to look at how the trauma looks at the goals of Samora, right, in a way, in a kind of abstracted way, and uh, the politics, and then from there, what? So let me show you the first clip. The tradition of venerating, worshipping, if you want, natural phenomena, certain trees, certain landscape features, certain caves, certain rocks. I can see them monumental in the sense they are venerated as objects, representing ideas. project is difficult for a number of reasons. It's not easy to revive feelings and to revive what one has lived through to celebrate uh, the death of uh, a number of people to whom I was very close in circumstances that are so uh, absurd.
feel that this is not a common space, it's not a domestic space, it's not, a, it's not even a monumental space. It's a different thing, it's, it's, a, it's a memory, it's a memorial. This thing doesn't have a preparation to come out of the ground, but it just sort of juts out. is penetrated by this presence as it was violated by the planet that fell. So this is an early part of the film that kind of introduces us to the space. Um, and uh, let me just put uh, the memorial as opposed to um, a monument or a statue needs to speak, I guess, in the ideas of Fujaj, who was, you know, ironically, um, he was a, you know, white aristocrat communist who worked, who, who didn't leave after 75. I mean, he came from Portugal and he stayed there and he stayed. And he ended up working um, as an advisor to the Minister of Public Works and, and, and Housing, and he built the parliament, he designed the parliament. So he was fully committed to to Mozambique um, and this idea of non-racialism it, it speaks volumes as to how Samora thought that the, the, the country should be built up again and it's interesting when you go there especially from here you spend time in Maputo the issues that kind of we come across here on a daily basis about race and about um, uh, and even in relationships you know mixed relationships in Maputo is not really an issue, as, whereas here we have it kind of in front of us and we, it's on the tip of our tongues often. In Maputo and in Mozambique it's not really, I fi find it not really to be an issue. So it's kind of interesting that just next door you can have that, you can live life like that without having to always revert to discussions, discussions on race. Um, uh, so I was saying the memorial as opposed to a monument or a statue needs to speak to um, I guess in the ideals of Fujaj need to speak to that to an aesthetic of humanity and not an aesthetic of ego right um, uh, and if you see that the, if you haven't been, been or, or seen the, memo the memorial um, we'll see it now in a couple of clips but there is basically it's like a wedge it's on the exact spot that the plane crashed and there is a wedge uh, section to the to, to, to the monument here where um, there's there's like a a, a a hole in the ground and in that hole in the ground are fragments of the plane itself because you know it, it fell here and there were pieces of the plane everywhere as you saw in the archive so whatever was left was thrown into the space as this kind of living testament to what happened um, the kind of ugliness and the brutality of what happened exists in this space. Uh, let me show you uh, another clip. This element of brutality, at the same time, this element of discipline that was characterizing that group of people. There was a very disciplined group of people and expressing uh, a country that aspired at least to be a very disciplined country.
should not be, how would I put it, beautiful. Uh, it's not uh, what one looks for in a thing like this, but that this should give you still, centuries after it happened, a sense of anguish. how important that this thing should be mute. This thing should should speak. It should echo the sound of the wind of the mountain and should create its own lament. timeless. If you look at it in pure abstract terms, it's, it's an extraordinarily beautiful color against a natural color. I mean, rust is a natural material, still, in a way, is less natural than the rust itself. The fact that rust would protect and at the same time be so expressive would dispense with any madness forever. Okay, so five minutes. Okay, so um, you see here that so the memorial was constructed by Fujaj in uh, ninety six, was it ninety six, uh, and the crash was in the mid eighties. So um, this material was collected around the time, you know, around 2000. Uh, they went there to the memorial and Fujaj took, the, took uh, Lawrence and Pipash, his son, through the understanding of what it's all about. The, he wanted a physical experience. He wanted a physical engagement with the, with the piece. He wanted um, uh, the wind to engage with it. He wanted the air to corrode the rust, to rust the pipes. He wanted to, it to be living in a way. Um, he, he didn't, his idea was that the surroundings wouldn't be touched, that you would walk there, that you would take your time to approach the monument. Um, and then something very interesting and uh, absurd also happened in 2006 when during the, you know, Becky's uh, African Renaissance period, the local council from uh, Mbuzini made a pledge to uh, upgrade the monument. Um, and it's worth noting that uh, Fujaj, uh, I'm going to show you something now, but Fujaj had his, his budget for the upgrade was um, two million. Two million dollars, right? At his proposal. And the proposal from the municipality of uh, and Buzini was 15 million and and they won but let's see uh, what Fujaj himself ha has to say about what happened psychological time and physical time sometimes are parallel you should not come quickly to the monument you should have a, a certain amount of effort you should take your time. You should get that psychological time before you arrive here. What they 
indeed was diametrically opposed to the original concept. which was very admirable that uh, this monument should be complemented by a number of facilities like a museum, an auditorium, and sort of logistic facilities like sanitary facilities and things like that, which personally I think we should be very grateful we in Mozambique for the South African government decision to do that. What I react against is doing those things physically against the monument because they actually empty the original concept of its meaning totally. It was destroyed by this idea that a monument has to be big. has nothing to do with size, but with proportion. Leaving the landscape around it as pristine as possible was fundamental. You can create everything you need in a beautiful way, complementing without detracting the presence of the monument. Conclusion: um, the the film uh, that we're still working on. You can see that it's not color graded, it's not sound mixed. Um, is less about Samora. Um, it's it kind of touches on some of the conspiracy around the crash itself, um, but more about uh, like I said, an ideal that died that day, and the idea of how do we as Africans um, memorialize. How do we remember the past? You know, if 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 the journey of living is to carry the dead with us, how then do we memorialize? Não vamos esquecer o tempo que passou. Okay, that's uh, a 
obviously an artisanal recording taken during uh, a big rally in Maputo in the in the early 80s. And the song that they're singing, Navamashes Kisir, is We Won't Forget. We Won't Forget the Times That Are Past. And Samora is, is, uh, is, is, is involved in a kind of a song and response uh, connection with his audience, which is probably uh, probably tens of thousands of people. Um, and what the song is saying is that in the past times, in the colonial times, one of the lines that you heard there is that was a time when a father of five children could still be called boy. And what he's doing is recalling the forms of oppression in a, in a populist, in a rhetorical fashion. And what I want to talk about today in the time that I'm allowed is a little bit about what Samora's voice meant in rhetorical terms and in terms of what I believe it was a reframing of political discourse which took place from just before independence, through independence and on into the 1980s and which is I think now largely, uh, largely been lost. Um, Alan referred to Samora's sense of the power of history and I think that's absolutely, absolutely correct that he, he, he thought historically not not in terms of being a professional historian, but how history informed politics and informed political discourse. I want to talk, uh, I also want to say that it's very important to understand, in, in my view, that the term rhetoric, we talk about mere rhetoric, oh, that's merely rhetoric. I think that's a fundamental uh, category error. Rhetoric is a form of political action, first of all. Secondly, Rhetoric is not only about persuading your listeners, it's also about compelling your listeners, coercing your listeners into a, a, a frame of discourse for which they can have no response that is, is socially acceptable. And Frelimo became extremely good at doing this, uh, in, particularly in the period from uh, just before independence through to about 1982 or so. Um, and this, this coercive character of, of rhetoric can also be seen in a, in a sense, as a form of violence. So I think it's important to recognize that, uh, I, and I'm going to argue a little bit with what, what, um, with what Alan was talking about at the end of his talk about democracy. I think the concept of democracy that Frelimo had and that um, the liberation movements generally have is not the same as the Western idea of democracy. It's not about, uh, it's not about the... Uh, uh, institutional arrangements about voting, about having regular elections and so on. It's about the idea that the mass of people, the demos, can challenge in a fundamental way the relations of power and property which exist. Um, the importance of Samora's voice, of course, is that he uh, learned social communication, if I can call it that, in a situation of armed struggle. In other words, through meetings, through making speeches, through talking to crowds of people, large groups, small groups, and so on, in liberated areas. And there are multiple photographs of him standing on platforms made of, of pieces of wood, but in order to be higher than the audience. And, and typically with his finger extended like this, there are many, many photographs of Samora in the middle of a speech making his point like this. You're, you, if, you, if you look on, uh, if I can make a quick plug, my website, Mozambique History Net, you'll find multiple images of Samora in that kind of pose. The primary form of, of, uh, of social communication after independence uh, continued to be speech making, and Samora was the primus inter pares of speech makers. His, his rallies were attended by tens of thousands of people. Uh, I attended multiple uh, rallies. One of the first things that I did when I arrived in Mozambique in 1979 was to go to a rally and learn the hard way that once in the rally you could not leave. There were, the, there were soldiers, as it were, around the edge of the gathering. And even if you wanted to go to the loo, no, 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 you can't leave, you must respect the, uh, the will of the people and so on. And so the practice of the liberated zones transferred into the urban areas and, of course, into the rural areas as well. Frelimo leaders and Samora continually made tours around the provinces and made speeches in rural areas, in villages, and in cities. So Samora's voice, his actual voice, was something that one heard constantly on the radio and, as it were, read through the transcriptions of his speeches that were published in newspapers and in, uh, in uh, news magazines and so on. And of course, that brings up the question of language. Samora was was committed to only speaking Portuguese in public. 
because it was the language of national unity. But the problem was that the vast majority of Mozambicans didn't understand Portuguese and certainly couldn't read Portuguese, even if the newspapers were available to them. Uh, and there was no television in those days either. And so the big problem was how to communicate these, how to, how to, how to make this form of social communication uh, effective. And often uh, they would have a, a, a simultaneous translator and on occasion, if it was a language that Samora himself understood, he would stop and correct the interpreter and say, no, no, that wasn't what I said. What I said was, and then explain it in Shangan or Swahili in one or two occasions, and then go back to speaking in Portuguese. Um, I just want to play quickly a, a, a very short extract uh, uh, of, of this process going on. And it's, a, it's an extract from a speech just before independence. Uh, and in fact, uh, with my, my co-researcher David Hedges, we've recently published a book in Portuguese, which is an analysis of this speech, um, uh, in which he, he satirizes the, the status and attitudes of assimilado people, who he argues were mentally colonized. Okay, I'm not going to play the whole whole speech, obviously, but just to give you a flavour of what what the, uh, this was, this was a speech given in Beira, which was a city um, uh, a city of colonial oppression, probably fiercer than than Lorenzo Marques was, a city of racism, a city, a city of extreme exploitation, um, and Samora was an unknown personality when he arrived there. This this speech took place during uh, the triumphal journey which Samora made uh, just before, in the months before independence, in which he zigzagged through every province, speaking at the former Filimo bases, speaking at big cities, and importantly, presenting to the crowds the new Filimo governors of each province. So it was a kind of delineation of power, a reframing in geographical terms, if you like, which was accompanied by the reframing that took place in terms of, of discourse and uh, uh, and, and political political rhetoric. And what's he saying? This is this extract. This particular passage in the, in the speech is very interesting because he's talking about assimilados, who are people who had adopted uh, Portuguese customs in order to gain some kind reduced form of citizenship. If if you if you were unable to do that, if you didn't well, couldn't show that you were fluent in Portuguese, that you routinely ate. Uh, bacalhau and other forms of Portuguese food with a knife and fork, uh, that you had a Portuguese name instead of an African name and so on, you were simply considered to be a native. If you're an assimilado, you acquired certain rights, including rights to employment and so on and so forth. And what he's saying in this speech is that the assimilado is ashamed of his mother, for example. He comes home and he finds his mother cooking a Mozambican dish. And he says, instead of resenting the mother to his friends as this is my mother and she's cooking she's cooking for us he says this is the maid she's cooking for us and the crowd reacts with laughter and applause because they recognize the behavior and so what Samora is doing is presenting a kind of a little dramatic piece as, as uh, Alan said he's a performer 
and he's assuming the accent of the assimilado. He says at the beginning, the assimilado thinks he's superior because he knows 20 phrases of Portuguese and can copy the accent of the colonialist. Um, he says, uh, when he goes to the bureaucracy to fill out uh, forms to apply for a driver's license or an ID card, where it says mother and father, he says father and mother unknown because he doesn't want to admit that he's got uh, African parents. And so the assimilado is rejecting completely his, his, his African character in order to uh, be accepted by, by Portuguese society, by Portuguese colonialism. And at the end he says, but Mr. Assimilado, despite all of this, you're still a black person. You're still an African. You're wasting your time. And the crowd explodes into applause and, uh, and laughter. But what's also interesting is I went to Beira probably in about 1990, early 90s, in other words, uh, 20, 20, more than 20 years after us, and I interviewed people who'd been at that, at that event. And one, one woman who I interviewed, who was herself from an assimilado family, was still offended and still resentful about the characterization that he made. And so the rhetoric, I want to suggest that Samora's rhetoric not only was embracing of people, but was also rejecting of people and was heard as rejecting. Um, during the triumphal journey which he made in the, in, the, in, the period, in the month before independence, he made about 30, 30 odd speeches. Most of which, interestingly, were never published a, in, as text, but not, almost all of which were broadcast on the radio. And I had a conversation with Sol Carvalho, who's also a filmmaker, but at that time was, was the head of the radio station uh, in Maputo, a white Mozambican. And he, he said that whenever he and the other radical whites who'd stayed behind and were working in the radio heard one of these speeches, they would sit there and listen to the speech. And at the end, they would sigh and say, well, there go another 200 Portuguese settlers with their suitcases packed. In other words, these speeches, which were heard as affirming by the African population, were heard as threatening by the white population. And so this rhetoric these rhetorical devices can be heard in a con can always be heard in fact must always be heard in the context of the political discourse of, of the particular period um, and I want to suggest that in fact when we work with speeches I, I, I it, it's for me it's a, uh, uh, Alan made reference to epistemology and science I can introduce another sort of technical term of social sciences I think this is a hermeneutical question I think we have to look at these speeches by actually recognizing them as acts of speech. In other words, let's listen whenever possible to the recordings rather than working from the transcripts which were often polished, repetition was avoided. The Portuguese, the register of the Portuguese language that Samora used in, in speeches like the one in Beira was the demotic speech of the Mozambican population. The register of Portuguese that he would use in a state banquet for the visiting President of Portugal, for example, was full of the correct use of the subjunctive, uh, a much more sophisticated vocabulary, much less repetition. As you, you heard him saying, I'm talking about assimilados, I'm talking about the assimilados, we're talking about the assimilados here, making sure that his audience was, uh, was following him and giving his interpreter time to make the points uh, emphatic, emphatically. So what I'm suggesting is that uh, Alan and, and all the rest of us who are researching on the Samora period, and particularly on Samora's life, and all, what Frelimo was doing in the period up to independence and post-independence, we look, need to look much more carefully than we have been doing. Well, well certain, let me take the blame. I'm not, I'm not accusing other people of not doing this. But my learning process has been to go back to the original speech act, to the, in, where possible even to the film of what was happening, to use these sources in a critical way. We're working, David Hedges, my colleague and I, are working uh, on, on an analysis of the triumphal journey, the viage en triomphal, as I mentioned earlier, as an act of inscribing the nation, if you like, as an act in which the assertion of power took place through speech, through journey, through the claiming of space. The, the presentation of the traitors to at Nashingwea camp after independence, where uh, a kind of um, a, a process of self-criticism was taken on by, by uh, people who had been characterized as traitors to, a, to Philema, but in some cases were merely critical of a particular Philema line, uh, played out in a very dramatic way. 
Um, and lastly, the, meet, the, the question of, of the ex-prisoners, the Frelimo prisoners who'd been captured by the Portuguese and were treated by Frelimo after independence with great mistrust, and many of them were sent for political re-education because they had not been through the forge of the armed struggle and therefore their political perspective, having been in jail with Portuguese prisoners, was different. So what I'm suggesting, just to conclude, is that listening to Samora's voice is not just an exercise uh, for somebody like me in, in nostalgia for a time of revolution that's been lost, but is an, ex an exercise of, of analysis and recognizing and uh, advancing hypotheses about what <coughs> Samora's voice actually meant in the politics of the time rather than what it means for us uh, now, uh, having, having lost all that, uh, all that promise and all that potentiality. Thank you. Okay, uh, this is about uh, legacy, and legacy, you know, like eventually associated to memory. And uh, how important is memory? Uh, I, I, I remember uh, uh, once, two years after the death of Samora, I, I went with an uh, initiative in uh, another province to show some uh, Samora Michelle documentaries to the uh, students. And uh, before I started, I asked, do you guys know who was Samora Michelle with Samora? And many of them didn't really know, didn't forget. So it, it's so quick that memory goes, you know, that the legacies are, are really important to, to, for us to keep them alive if, if they are really uh, useful. Uh, okay, this is about photographs of Samora Michelle uh, in Coxnam Coxnam uh, archive. Um, Coxnam uh, is described by the Minister of the Culture, Armand Artur, as a living memory of Mozambique. Nam, who died in 2012, was the son of uh, Chinese um, immigrants who settled in Mozambique at the beginning of the 20th century. Born in, the, in then Lorenzo Marcus, uh, present Maputo, uh, back in 1939, uh, Nam began journalistic career at the Focus Studio at the age of 16 and was later invited to join the team of journalists and Diario, Diario de Mozambique. He also worked for Noticias de Tard. According, according to Wikipedia, he became friends of Ricardo Rangel, a well-known Mozambican photographer. In 1917, Sonam and a group of other journalists founded magazine Tempo which was uh, opposed to Portuguese colonization, and at, at which he reported on Frelimo going, Frelimo going on. Upon the fall of the autocratic regime in Portugal in 1974, the magazine followed an openly leftist course towards the independence of Mozambique. In 1990, Naim was one of the leaders of a group of journalists who wrote the document, The Right of the People to Information. It was the precursor of the current laws and, of, and press freedom of Mozambique. From Nam's archive comes a series of photographs which document important phases from the beginning of the history of the independent Mozambique, ranging from the period of the nationalization through the liberation war of southern Rhodesia, the creation of agricultural cooperatives, communal villages, to the civil war which ripped the, ripped the country uh, apart for 16 years. Cocknam left a rich series of portraits and, and photographs of Samora and Michelle, which will reflect the personality of an essential figure of the Mozambican motherland. His work has been exhibited at home and in Denmark, France, Italy, Portugal, Sweden, and Zimbabwe, as well as having appeared in the New York Times, Times magazines, and observers, among others. Michelle was very aware of the power of the images. As a Secretary of Defense Department, Samora organized visits of press, researchers, and strategic guests to the camps and the liberation zones from the early stages of the struggle as part of the external pol policy of the movement. According to Oscar Monteiro, the first journalist to visit the country was a Yugoslavian filmmaker, Dragurin Popovic, 
who produced the documentary Venceremos in, uh, in 1966. In 1968, Basil Davidson observed the Second Congress of at Majeja in Nyasa province. The British documentary Behind the Lines was produced in 1971, directed by Margaret Dixon. In 1972, Mutrelimo received the Organization for African Unit OWA mission, led by his Executive Secretary Asmin Bita. The Italian Radio Emilia Hospital also sent a delegation in 1972. A Japanese photographer and journalist from the two Germans, Holland and China, also visited the country. However, the press in Mozambique, as well as in Portugal, had very little information about Frelimo and the life behind the lines. According to Cocknam, people in Lorenzo Marques didn't know Frelimo because the fights were far away. Although they know is that they were terrorists. They don't have information from Frelimo. Some people had information from Radio Tanzania, some had news from BBC, from the Voice of America, but obviously all these people were outside the Lorenzo Marques and like living near Rhodesia, Malawi, Zambia or Tanzania. But in Lorenzo Marques itself uh, at the time, you couldn't easily get the radio to hear about the stories unless you did it very carefully and hide it. The Lusaka Agreement was signed at 7 September 74. In November, the Mozambican airline uh, company called Data opened the route from Lorenzo Marques to Dar es Salaam in Tanzania with an inaugural flight. They invited 45 people, among them Frelimos, Armando Gebuza, Oscar Monteiro, Elder Martins, already in Lorenzo Marques preparing for the transition. The group included journalists who for the first time were going to cross the line. Moments before the departure, a group of photographer press were taken in front of the plane with Ricardo Rangel among them. The group joined Samora Michel in Lusaka and flew in a small biplane to Nashingweya. On board, Samora Michel alternated between contagious dynamism and short naps with the head of uh, internal administration, Armando Gebuz, and they went to the most famous military, political military center in Nashingweya, southwest of Dar es Salaam. It was a colonialist farm abandoned due to serious sources of water. When Frelimo entered the place in, 80 and in 1965, uh, there were no more than a few houses made on bricks surrounded by forests. The new camp for military preparation was opened by Samora Michel, who trained guerrillas. It became the most important reference point for Frelimo experience at later rhetorics of the liberated zones. The liberated zone simultaneously gave a first rehearsal of the what would be, after independence, Frelimo's integration plan for rural communities in the naturalist and revolutionary project for independence in Mozambique. A few weeks after the meeting, another group of Mozambican journalists joined Samora Michel in Nashingweya. Before the mo moment came, south of the capital prior to the independence, this group included Kocknam. He was apparently filled with various emotions. Everything was in a new footing and he was not sure if he was permitted to take pictures of Michel, who, admired, who he admired. It was the first time Kocknam saw uh, Samora, and the light was fantastic. He recalls, it was when after great burst of rain, the sun explodes, and the cloud comes and covers the sun, but the light comes becomes bright and translucent. That was the situation with the light on his face. That is the portrait that Grasa Michel and Mandela have in their house in Maputo. It resulted from one, two shots, no more, because I was afraid. He ended up secretly stealing these shots. The portrait of, of Samora Michel at Nashingue in 1974 was the first photographer taken of the Frelimo leader by Kokna. But looking at the archive, I found out a very strong closeness between these photographs. You see? And my guess is that the two or three shots that he did trying to find a picture of Samora were these ones that actually were not used and were uh, lived alone. And there is an interesting uh, uh, story about this uh, photograph. But anyway, uh, the photograph was published several times in articles and books along with comments, comments 
In the Cronus article, it says that Michelle's face was remarkable, has a remarkable clarity to it, maybe due to the final tone range, but perhaps also because the future lie completely open. Cocknam's accounts describe that the natural light conditions in Nashingwe in terms that are photographically almost divine, as if the events, events conspired for the revelation of the leader's face. In the monograph Samora by Cocknam, Grasa Michel comment, comment was that Cocknam captured exceptionally well in photography one of the moments in which the body, the expression of the face, but in particular the eyes, reveal a restless Samora. Things of brightness in the look that much say of the inside and every inquiring mind, and ever inquiring mind. Cock told an interesting side story related to this photograph. It's, it said that requested for the party to reproduce the negative disappeared and the person that held responsible for it was in prison for 15 days. And I found also that eventually other photographs have been taken during that visit. You know, and, and here there is this uh, really gesture of Samora Michelle trying to interact with the journalists. And uh, eventually Samora Michelle presented to the people in the camp the, 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 the guests that were with him. Cocknam covered many of the president's later travels, like those to Russia, China, China, Vietnam. He also followed the president inside the country, according to Cocknam. Michelle also enjoyed having a multiracial delegation in such trips, which he used as an expression of Mozambicanidad, Mozambicanness. Michelle addressed dozens of open rallies during the 11 years of his presidency. Cocknam said that he was the greatest mass communicator of the world. Samora could convince a cadaver. Cocknam dismystified the spread ideas of this uh, close relationship between him and the president. I took many portraits of Samora, and the myth was born that we were intimate, he said. I only fell in love with his personality and never lost an opportunity to, to take a photograph of him. 